It's the Mammoth Club Sharktacular Special. Hello, Mam Fam, and welcome to our Sharktacular Special. You may know that I am obsessed with sharks, and this week is Shark Week. It is my holy week. It is my favorite week of the year, where you get to watch a week long of shark programming on Discovery Channel. I've literally been watching it for 25 years. As proven by this drawing I drew of me when I was like seven, of me watching Shark Week. It's not a drawing of a shark, although I have plenty of those too. This is a drawing of me watching Shark Week. So to celebrate Shark Week, and more importantly, sharks in general, I am headed to both Walt Disney World and Universal Orlando to do every shark-related experience possible. Yes, there are enough to make a full video out of. But what would a Shark Week special be without some experts? I actually had the chance to speak with some of the marine biologists, some of the scientists that are doing work for sharks right now. You've seen them on Shark Week before, and I got to speak with them, ask them questions about sharks, and it was actually like the greatest day of my life other than when I actually got to go great white shark diving. Look, here's me, great white shark diving. These are photos I took of great white sharks. It was incredible. Anyway, as we go about today on all of our sharktastic, sharkerific, shark sharkterful, I'll workshop it, adventures, I'm going to be sharing some clips and interviews so you can hear from the experts about sharks, some fun facts, some important information about why we should care about sharks. I'm super duper excited about this. I hope you are too. Even if you don't care about sharks, maybe you will by the end of this episode. Let's get to it. It's going to be awesome. Nailed it. That's it. Let's go. First up on our fantastic adventures today, Finding Nemo, the big, the blue, and beyond. This is a musical about Finding Nemo, as the name might suggest. Now it has undergone a bit of a transformation. Initially when this show opened, it was about 45 minutes long, and in my opinion, very confusing. If you weren't intimately familiar with the details of the movie Finding Nemo, I think it was confusing because they didn't do a classic Disney abridged musical where they go like, and then through a series of unfortunate events. No, instead they just sang the whole thing. So multiple people I know walked out a little confused as to the plot line. When it reopened after the closure, they did tighten it up a little bit. It's about 25 minutes now. And the fish are at the Marine Life Institute as seen in Finding Dory. And they're like recapping the story of Nemo. So you get a little bit more of that abridgment, but it still has the music and the very cool puppets. They also added some interesting set pieces and made some upgrades there. It's still not my favorite if I'm being honest with you, but it does feature large puppets of three different sharks. So obviously we're gonna see it today. <laughs> Finding Nemo the Musical, and that maintains not my favorite musical. Sorry, but the shark scene, it's my personal favorite, which isn't surprising, but the shark puppets are very, very cool. The sharks in Finding Nemo are named Bruce, Anchor, and Chum. Bruce, being the main shark, is a great white shark. Fun fact, his name Bruce comes from Jaws because the mechanical shark in Jaws was given the nickname Bruce by director Steven Spielberg, which is actually an insult because his lawyer was named Bruce. The shark notoriously didn't work. In fact, they also called it the great white turd, but more Jaws facts coming at you later. You've also got Chum. Chum is a mako shark. Now, mako sharks are the fastest sharks in the ocean. They can swim up to 60 miles an hour in short bursts, and they use those short bursts to fire at their prey out of nowhere like a bullet. And then their prey tactic is to bite off the tails of their victims, leaving them helpless, and then they can just luxuriate and eat slowly, which ruthless, but I appreciate it. You've also got Anchor. Anchor is a hammerhead shark. Now, hammerhead sharks, there's actually multiple different classes of hammerhead sharks, but he's most likely a great hammerhead shark, which is the largest species. And unfortunately, great hammerheads are on the critically endangered species list. Generally speaking, about a third of shark species right now are at risk for extinction, and the great hammerhead are one of the top on that list. We're gonna hear more in a little bit from the experts about why sharks are important and why we need to care that they are going extinct, but just, but just know, know that sharks like Anchor, like the iconic great hammerhead, that's a, that's a species of shark that we might not see in a few years. In some places, their populations have reduced by 80%. But 
Before we get into a little bit more of that, let's talk about the key plot point with sharks in Finding Nemo, and that's that the sharks want to befriend Marlin and Dory and not eat them. Honestly, that's the most unbelievable part of Finding Nemo, even more than the talking singing fish. Sharks are carnivores. There's a no population where they're going to eat kelp, as they sing in the song, instead of fish. They don't eat anything but meat and protein. <laughs> but I did a little math. Upon watching some Shark Week episodes and speaking with Dr. Austin Gallagher, a 20-foot great white shark has to consume 50,000 calories a day. 50,000 calories. Think about that. That's so many seals. It's not actually so many seals as explained by this. They usually eat about 1% of their body weight per day. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a 200 pound shark, they might eat two pounds per day. And depending on what the, the, how rich of a prey source that is, if it's blubber, there's going to be a lot of calories in two pounds. You know, <laughs> they definitely don't eat one seal per day. That, that would just be crazy. They, they, there's no way they could do that. Um, but they, they're usually just kind of snacking on stuff until they find something that's really worth their time, like a big fish or a seal or a turtle, or in the case of, you know, the show, they get really lucky, uh, a dead whale. Okay, it's on your left now, going to the bait. Okay, I got it, I got it. But I did a little research, and the average clownfish weighs about 200 grams. One ounce of clownfish meat is about 25 calories, so they're packing a lot of protein per bite. But doing the math, thanks to the mathematician at home, that means that a great white shark would have to eat 284 clownfish a day to hit that 50,000 calorie diet. I don't, I don't see that happening. Now, I will say through my research, it says that shark species, including great whites, will eat clownfish. Clownfish are pretty easy to catch. They're pretty easy to spot, but that's probably smaller sharks. That's probably juvenile great white sharks. That's probably baby great white sharks. Your 20 foot great white shark is not wasting its time trying to eat a clownfish. And I think by the scale, Bruce is a pretty big shark. But also talking about how much something can pack pound for pound, the mako shark, like our friend Chum, should not be ignored when talking about sharks. Again, they're the fastest shark in the ocean, coming at you like a torpedo, but they're also incredibly powerful. Mako sharks used to be mostly around eight or nine feet, but recently researchers have been seeing what they call monster makos that are getting upwards of 12, 13 feet long, which means there is now a competition in the ocean between great white sharks and mako sharks for the same food. Upon learning this, I asked Dr. Gallagher a question we all want to know. Who's winning in a tussle? Who are you betting money on? Mako sharks are pretty powerful. They are very fast. Uh, they're actually the fastest shark in the ocean. But, you know, speed isn't going to get you there uh, over the finish line. So if I had to put a bet on it, you know, white shark all day. And there you have it. The great white shark reigns supreme as the top predatory fish in the ocean. But you know what? This predator is getting pretty hungry right now, so let's swim on over to Epcot where we're gonna dine shark side. Made it over to Epcot, and I'm sure you know which pavilion we're gonna be hanging out in today. There is one pavilion and one pavilion only. We're scooting there right meow. A rainbow, how beautiful. Anyway, we've made it to our lunch destination, the Coral Reef Restaurant. This is a long-standing Epcot restaurant located in the Seas Pavilion, and one whole wall of the restaurant is a giant glass look into the huge aquarium here at the Seas Pavilion. So we're going to go dine on some hopefully delicious lunch and look at sharks while we do it. Welcome inside the Coral Reef, which is designed to make you feel like you're underwater because most importantly, oh my gosh, there's a shark right there. Y'all, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to be so distracted during this portion of the video. Look how beautiful. Oh, hi, buddy because they were kind enough to seat me at a window table, which means I get an incredible view into the tank here at the Seas Pavilion. You know, this was once the largest aquarium in North America until the Georgia Aquarium in my hometown of Atlanta took over, um, but it is absolutely massive. It's so big, in fact, if you were to siphon off one inch of water throughout this entire tank, you could fill Spaceship Earth with it. And there are tons of different species in here. We're talking sharks, rays, turtles, fish, 
I'm gonna get the QR code out in a second, which has a guide to what you might see inside the tank. But before I do that, before I get any more distracted, let's take a look at the menu here at the Coral Reef. You've got a couple different specialty cocktails. They've got the Coral Rita and the Abyss. They serve Reef Amber beer here, but mostly you're gonna see a classic Disney cocktail menu. A couple different appetizers. Of course, the menu is very seafood heavy, so you've got a seafood artichoke dip, shrimp cocktail, clam chowder, and then you've got a couple of different entrees of, again, seafood heavy shrimp and grits, a salmon, a mahi-mahi, but they have some other options as well. They have a plant-based mushroom ravioli, a prime rib, and a harissa chicken. And not to worry, nothing that you can eat on the menu can you see in the tank. Speaking of feeding though, I was talking earlier about how great white sharks, a 20 foot great white shark needs to eat 50,000 calories a day, which is why they're probably not messing around with little, hi, hello, I love you. I want you to know that I think you're very cute. Hi, oh my God, hi, I love you so much. Oh my God, this is the best meal of my life. It's not gonna be, but it is, you know what I mean? Anyway, uh, 50,000 calories today, which is why a big great white shark is probably not bothering itself with a small clownfish like Nemo. A large great white shark is looking for something that is worth the effort it's gonna take for him to eat it. And because of this, a huge 20 foot great white shark is probably not concerning itself with something like a clownfish or any of these smaller fish. It's gonna look for things like larger fish like tuna and mackerel, seals, sea lions, rays, dolphins, other sharks perhaps. Look at that beautiful hammerhead up there. They're the top predatory fish in the world for a reason. But one thing a great white shark loves is a whale, and specifically a dead whale. If a whale passes away and is just floating along in the ocean, that is like a Thanksgiving buffet for a great white shark. And they enjoy it so much that they can eat 10 times that 50,000 calorie limit in one feeding of a something dead like a whale. And I had some questions about this. So I took it to the professionals. Here's what Dr. Austin had to say about those feeding frenzies. Uh, but it's also, like you said, building up those energy stores, making those deposits in the bank that is the energy of the, the, the white shark. So they're gonna eat a lot until they really can't eat anymore. And then they're gonna have enough nutrients in their body. They're gonna convert all that into you know fatty acids, lipids, and they can actually be sustained for one month, maybe even more after that. Wow. So they wouldn't need wow. to eat for like over a month. Yeah. Wow. That speaks to why this is such an important, you know, thing for white sharks, these whale carcasses. And yes, I do know that I mentioned that great white sharks will eat other sharks. And there's a prevalent rumor in the shark community that sharks will eat their own babies. And it kind of ties in with this idea that sharks are mindless killers that are just eating everything in sight and walking around like a garbage can. So I talked to Tom, the fish, heard about this, and here's what he had to say. A female shark is unlikely to pop out her babies and then do a 180 and immediately <laughs> gobble them. If you had a scenario where there was a pupping ground, uh, if, you know, another shark came in, they would, you know, they would eat them. That's that's why for the sharks that we do know uh, more about their reproduction, for example, lemon sharks is a very great uh, example. So pregnant females wait until the highest of tides and go deep into the mangroves, uh, have their pups and then come out. And then that keeps the babies safe in shallow water that no other sharks can access. And speaking of a shark's maternal instinct, do you ever think sharks are cute? I know I think sharks are cute, but most people when they think of sharks think of this. Because they've seen this. I personally think all sharks are cute, including great white sharks, but I did ask wildlife expert Forrest Galante if you could give scritchy scratches to a gray white shark or a tiger shark or a bull shark or some of these big predatory sharks the same way you can give them to a pajama shark. And here's what he had to say. Sharks have a specialized organ on the, on the front of their snout called the ampullae of Lorenzini. And that organ detects my magnetic electric energy, right? And when you stimulate that, it's like overstimulating. It's like getting a, a ridiculously relaxing massage. And as you see in that um, video, the pajama sharks were literally lining up for it, right? Like I'm like over here rubbing this one and one's nuzzling me here, one's in the armpit. I'm like, I'll get to you in a second. You know? And it's, uh, it, it's such a joyous thing to have like sharks showing affection. So the small ones like that, that are really, really inquisitive and nosy, it's certainly a lot easier than taking a 14 foot tiger shark and, and turning, you know, giving her the nose rub and a lot safer for the hands too. But yeah, I mean, in theory, you can more or less do that to any shark, especially those that have the advanced ampullae. Note to self, don't pet great white sharks. 
as much as you may want to. My meal has arrived and look at the nice shadow effect we're getting because of the aquarium. You know what? Worth it. I started with some dinner rolls. They were very generic dinner rolls with some plain butter. But for my entree, I went for the cast member recommended shrimp and grits. It's Cajun grilled shrimp with a seafood grit cake and dewy hash and a Cajun emulsion. Looks pretty good. I love grits. I love shrimp and grits, so I'm excited to give this a whirl. I also pulled up the uh, sea life spotting guide. There's a QR code on the menu that you can pull it up. Cast member said it's not all inclusive, but it will include the majority or the more exciting animals inside the tank, including four different species of shark uh, and a couple species of rays as well. So I am going to be on the lookout as I eat uh, for the rest of the meal to identify all four. Some of them have already come by, but I'm hoping they'll come by again so we can talk about them. All right, let's get in here, get some of this grit cake, which looks awesome get a shrimp. I want to eat this, but I also want to look at that sand tiger shark up there. I'm hoping he gets closer again. Ooh. You know what? I am delightfully surprised by this. The Coral Reef is a restaurant that used to be like the it restaurant at Epcot. And then as more places in the World Showcase and the festivals kept taking off, I feel like Coral Reef just went down as far as food goes. And I always liked it, though, because, I mean, okay, the same tiger shark's coming back. We'll talk about the food again in a second. But look at him. Let's talk about him. He's coming right at us. He wants us to talk about him. He's so excited. He's like, please, speak about me. I'm a sand tiger shark. They average four to nine feet, and they can be found in every ocean um, except the eastern Pacific. But unfortunately, they are one of the most endangered sharks in the world. According to the IUCN, which is the International Union for Conservation of Nature, that's who ranks different species on what their endangered category is. They are listed as vulnerable globally. However, unfortunately, in some part of the world, they are considered critically endangered. And despite their snaggly teeth and aggressive looking mouth, they're not usually aggressive towards humans. However, everything I was saying and learning about great white sharks not eating their children earlier doesn't necessarily apply to them. Because while they don't necessarily eat their children in Europe, the first baby to develop eats its siblings. So, anyway, here is a scout hammerhead and another sand tiger. Oh my god, look at this! Oh my god! We're gonna hope the scout hammerhead comes back so we can talk about the shrimp and grits real quick. Anyway, I feel like coral reef became less delicious, but I always loved it because of this experience. However, I gotta say, I'm very impressed with the shrimp and grits. The shrimp itself has that nice kind of off the grill kind of char flavor that you can tell. It was definitely grilled shrimp. There's a little bit of heat from the um, andouille sausage and the Cajun remoulade on top. Not a ton, but uh, more than I expected. And I like the fact that it's a grit cake. Not had that before. Um, so it's almost like when you get an au gratin macaroni and it's kind of crispy on the outside and then creamy on the inside. That's what it tastes like. Nice, delicious hash, huge portion. I'm very into this. I'm not saying it's the best meal I've ever had at Epcot, but I am saying it's very delicious and I'm glad that there is something very delicious to eat while looking at beautiful sharkies. Our friend the scalloped hammerhead is coming back. The scalloped hammerhead is pretty cute. I like all kinds of hammerheads. Uh, great whites are my number one, but I really like hammerheads as well because they are cute. They're funny looking. I just enjoy them. I also really have fond memories of watching the movie Flipper where one tries to eat Elijah Wood, but that's not the point. Scalloped hammerheads are a little bit easier to tell apart from other hammerheads because of that unique scalloped pattern across their nose. They'll actually use that to pin down hard to eat prey like rays um, at the bottom of the floor so that they can eat them, which is something that that unique head shape allows them to do that it wouldn't allow other sharks to do as easily. And you may be wondering, why doesn't the scalloped hammerhead just eat this ray right in front of me? Well, they get fed here at the seas. Oh, hello, there's our sand tiger buddy coming to say hey again. I'm not talking about you anymore. I'm really sorry, but I think you're very handsome. I love that smile. That's a handsome fella. Yeah, yeah. I just want to scritchy scratch that nose. I think you'd like it. 
anyway, as I was saying, why aren't these scalloped hammerheads eating these rays in here? Why aren't the other sharks eating the fish in here? Even though, yes, of course, fish and rays make up a big part of sharks' diets. Well, that's because sharks are smarter than probably most people give them credit for. Again, the reason the sharks are not eating the fish and the other animals in here is because they don't want to exert the energy that it would take to catch one of the fish or catch one of the rays. Just because they can eat it doesn't mean they have to. It's kind of like I was talking about with those great white sharks. They don't eat a giant seal every day because it takes a lot of energy. They have to exert a lot of energy um, and burn up. There's that hammerhead again that precious energy that they get from eating their prey. So the reason that this ray can swim directly in front of these two sharks and not worry about it is because the Disney cast members are taking care of feeding all of these different animals. And they've actually trained them because again, sharks are smarter than people give them credit for. And they feed them at night when it's dark in the tank and they shine a spotlight on one area of the tank. And the sharks are trained to go to where the spotlight is because that's where the food is gonna be. Now, unfortunately our friend, the scalloped hammerhead is critically endangered just like its cousin, the great hammerhead. Like pretty much all sharks, the reason that they are endangered or critically endangered is because of overfishing for shark fins. Shark fins are used as a delicacy in a lot of different cuisines, most notably shark fin soup uh, over in largely China, Hong Kong area. However, we can't only uh, say that it's the fault of, of Asian countries because European countries equated almost half of the sharks that are overfished every year. And I'm talking humans kill 100 million sharks a year. 100 million. Wrap your, <laughs> try and wrap your brain around that number. That number is shocking and very, very bad for the ocean. <laughs> Just to combat that, sharks kill less than 10 people a year. So I think we know who's causing more damage. But the reason specifically that scallop hammerheads get overfished, uh, they have a nice looking fin to start, but also they form large groups, which makes it easy for fishermen to capture and take care of a bunch of them, um, as opposed to animals like great white sharks, which are solitary creatures. They're way too big, way too fast. The effort from the fishermen is not worth it. Sad reality is if we don't do something soon, animals like the scalloped hammerhead are not gonna exist any longer. So I'm sad. If you want to learn more about thinning uh, and shark fin soup, the documentary Thin is excellent. It was done by Eli Roth. It is very hard to watch, but it is incredibly, incredibly eye-opening. Whoa, look at the guitar fish. But also there's the sandbar shark again. So let's talk about them. The sandbar shark is listed as endangered as far as its endangered status goes. And again, that status is due to finning. They uh, have quite a large dorsal fin, which is a, is a prize to I don't even want to call them humans, the monsters that are capturing these, these fish and chopping off their fins. Now the sandbar shark can get to be about eight feet long. And what's cute about them are those big curious eyes. Whenever I look at them, I just, I'm like, how can people be scared of this animal? It's just got like big, like dorky looking eyes that are staring at you. Um, but that's actually because they're tracking things uh, in the environment as they swim along so that they can hunt things like fish a little bit easier. But the eyes are just so different than what you expect on a lot of different sharks like Quint's famous speech in Jaws about how great white sharks' eyes are, are black like a doll's eyes. And you can see that as well on the scout hammerhead as he goes by. But not the sandbar shark. He's just like, hey, you guys want to hang out? What's going on? What are you doing over there? Like, I want to I want to feed him some of my shrimp. I think he might like them. Anyway, it's good to hear that despite finning, sandbar sharks are still pretty abundant in the Atlantic Ocean, which is why they are only a vulnerable status as opposed to this endangered we've seen with some of the other sharks. Oh, there he is. He knows. Hey, buddy. I love you. You look cute. Yeah, come show those pretty eyes off. And there's only one shark left in the tank that we haven't had the chance to speak about very much. And it's because he keeps going over there on that side of the tank. And I'll see him for a second, but he hasn't come over here. It's the smallest shark that I'm seeing in the tank. Let's go ahead and talk about him. And I hope that when we go into the actual sea base, we'll get a closer look. The black nose shark is just a little guy. The average black nose shark gets to be about four feet in length. And they're listed as endangered on the endangerment species category list. They're called the black nose shark because that cute little boop on the end of their nose it looks like they stuck their nose in ink or something now unlike the other sharks here the black nose shark the biggest threat to them is not 
humans killing them for their fins because they're so small, but actually uh, as bycatch when uh, people are catching shrimp. Uh, bycatch is when sharks accidentally end up in fishermen's nets, uh, entangled in them, uh, or brought up to the surface and they're ultimately killed. It's usually because the sharks are trying to eat the fish as well. And in the case of the black nose shark, large numbers of juvenile black noses often get caught uh, when folks are shrimp fishing. Had a nice meal at the coral reef and now we are headed into the seas with Nemo and friends. This is the slow moving dark ride to the Finding Nemo story. So of course we're gonna see our friends, Bruce, Anchor, and Chum yet again. And then we'll be in the sea base where we can take a different look at the sharks we just saw and do some shark activities. Welcome friends to the sea base. This is the multi-level aquarium slash sea activity space slash turtle talk with crush at the exit of Siege of Nemo friends. This is an awesome part of the pavilion. It's a great place to come enjoy some air conditioning, uh, burn off some energy, and you don't have to ride the ride if you if you don't want to to come enjoy the sea base. We are headed in first before we go look at those sharks again to Bruce's shark world. Themed, of course, after our three sharks from Finding Nemo. Let's take a closer look at them, shall we? Here at Bruce's Shark House, you can learn a lot about sharks. There's a cute photo opportunity with Bruce and the other sharks, but there's also interesting information that I don't think enough people take time to look at. For example, we don't want to bite you. Again, there's not a ton of shark attacks every year, though the media might tell you otherwise. There's less than 10 humans killed by sharks every year, which is tragic, of course, however, you are in the shark's house and sharks to shark in, uh, but here are some helpful tips to uh, be safe when you're in the ocean, like don't bother a shark. Feel self-explanatory, but it's not always. Don't wear shiny jewelry because it can look like shrimp. Don't go in the water if you're bleeding, if you've cut your finger or something like that. Don't go in the water because sharks can smell a drop of blood over a mile away. Don't wear bright colored clothing. Definitely don't swim alone. Don't go at night. Sharks tend to feed at dusk and dawn uh, and, and are more aggressive at night because that's when they do a lot of their hunting. So just little things like that. And it can help make sure you are safe. I also like here we've got Bruce's shark scratch book where he has collected a bunch of photos of all of his sharky friends. This right here is a picture of a shark breaching. One of my favorite shows on Shark Week, I watch it every single year, is called Air Jaws and it's all about sharks jumping out of the water and they uh, record how high they can jump and everything. It's fascinating. I like this because it's showing us all of uh, Bruce's little friends. You've got Wanda over here who is a whale shark, the largest fish in the world, but it eats tiny little krill. There's also a whale shark destiny in the Finding Dory film. Sometimes she shows up at Turtle Talk too. And then you've got Susie. Susie's a bull shark. Interesting thing about bull sharks is they can swim in fresh water too, which might be terrifying to some people, but just, just a heads up. Bull sharks are in fact one of, if not the most aggressive shark in the world, as confirmed by Tom, uh, who worked on a special this year called Cocaine Sharks, uh, about what would happen if sharks you get it. Uh, and this is what he said. Bull sharks are already a little bit spicy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's putting it mildly. Bull sharks, <laughs> yeah, they uh, they ain't playing around. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so if you took a bull shark and removed what was left of its very thin and limited inhibitions, <laughs> good Lord, you'd see it walking down the street mugging grannies <laughs> for change. Our skin is different than other fish. Give it a touch. Oh, he likes it. I'm giving him scratches. It feels like cardboard because it's cartilage. Another thing that sharks are killed for is their cartilage because it's used in different products and people falsely believed that it could cure cancer. Here we're talking about how sometimes sharks accidentally bite humans. As you can see, a human on a surfboard looks a lot like a seal. So usually when sharks bite humans, it's a case of mixed identity because they don't want to bite this surfer. Do you know how gross you are to a shark? We're not near blubbery enough for a shark. So most of the time when a shark bites a human, they think it is a fish or a seal or something else they want to eat. And so they do a little exploratory bite to check it out. Unfortunately for the human, exploratory bite from a shark can cause major damage. And here you can learn about different products that sharks are used for because what's the scariest word to a shark? Human. So if you push these buttons, it shows you things like shark fin soup. Uh, shark skin. Ooh, used in shoes and stuff? Ooh, no thank you. Fertilizer. Fishing, of course, we talked about fishing already. Shark jewelry. 
shark cartilage. Again, mistakenly thought to cure cancer. You guys think I'm making this stuff up. I'm not. Cosmetics made from shark liver oil. It's called squalene. There is a plant-based version of squalene, though, so you can check your cosmetics. And then fish and jibs. Often the fish is shark. Oh, no. See, doesn't this make you so sad? Alert, human-sided. Got some more shark facts here. A little shark, ooh, a shark trivia. We're gonna do this, obviously. Bruce's shark challenge. Let's go. Hi, Bruce. Which of the following shark is not is a shark that does not use its teeth? That would be the basking shark. Good job. A few moments later. How, how did I rank? This is the greatest day. Wow, truly honored. A shark expert. Thank you, Bruce. Ooh, let's go talk to these cast members about sharks. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Have any questions? Anything that you care Oh, about? thank you. Sharks are my favorite animal, so oh my I'm... Oh gosh, you're talking to the right. I just want to look at the shark things you guys have. Oh <laughs> Gabby, take it away. <laughs> Rosie and Shadow, that's cute. And this is just a job, like, representation of a tiger shark. It's really cool. They have those crazy can opener style teeth, yeah. yeah. They're really cool. And they're serrated too, so they can just... Get in there. Yeah, exactly. What did you say the hammerhead's name was? Uh, Holly. Holly, okay. Yeah. My name's Molly, so yeah. very close. Very close, yeah. <laughs> so that's their head? Yeah, so this is their head. This is, like, all cartilage, which is really interesting. Just, like, how, like, usually with other species of shark, this is pretty much what we find. Like if you look at the x-ray, x-ray Whoa. Over here, and then you can see their cephalofoil is all cartilage. It's cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Now I know some of you are thinking you should go say hey to your uh, marine friend that's in that exhibit, but you know what friends, it is shark day. It is shark day. We are not doing anything that's uh, unrelated to sharks, so I promise we'll see him very, very soon. But for now, let's go see if we can get a closer look at those sharks that we were looking at at lunchtime. So up here, again, this huge ocean exhibit. I absolutely love looking at this. Sharkies. Sharkies. Where are you, sharkies? Sharkies? Bro, really sweet view of this ray. Oh my gosh, and look at the turtle. He's right here. Hello. Where are the sharks? Could you send the sharks over here, please? Found our sandbar sharks. Of course, they're down at the bottom. They live at the sandbar. Whoa. The sand tiger shark moves so slow. It reminds me of Jaws 3 when the great white is coming at their aquarium restaurant and it moves so slow. <laughs> like they didn't animate the 3D to have the tail moving or anything. It just like slowly crawls towards the glass. But speaking of Jaws, I think it's time to hit the road and start heading to our other park. As I was leaving though, I noticed another shark that we hadn't seen yet. It wasn't on the list at the restaurant, but there's a black tip shark up here. Quite cute sitting up here. You can tell he's a black tip shark because of the black tips of his fins. Black tip sharks are usually under five feet. Uh, they don't pose much of a threat to humans. They're really skittish and timid, so even if you're scuba diving, it can be hard to get near them. Look how pretty he is swimming up here. Well, after a jaw-inspiring meal at the Coral Reef and a fun lap around the Seas Pavilion, it is time to swim on down I-4 and say hello to my personal favorite shark. And just like that, we've made it to Universal Orlando, home to one of the most popular movies of all time, Probably to blame for post people's fear of sharks, but we're gonna go find all the Jaws stuff we can and talk a little bit more about them. Starting our universal adventure here on City Walk, where we're gonna pop into one of the stores. Many of you probably know that when Universal Studios Florida opened, they had a Jaws attraction. It was a boat ride that took place on Amity Island the year after the Jaws films, so it took place in 1976. It heralded Chief Brody as a hero, and moments of the queue, the pre-show, had interviews and morning shows in Amity Island that talked about the events of Jaws as if they were real, kind of documentary style. 
Unfortunately, the attraction was a disaster. They had huge problems with the mechanical shark, not unlike the actual film. They had problems with the water. They had to redo things many times. And eventually they ended up closing it to make way for the Wizarding World of Harry Potter Diagon Alley. One of the coolest things about Jaws though was the original iteration, the shark actually bit onto your boat and shook it. That was unfortunately one of the first things to go when they had to redo things. Now, one of my life's greatest regrets is the fact that I only went on that attraction one time in my whole life. We were Disney people mostly growing up, but I begged my parents to bring me to Universal Studios when I was like seven. Uh, because I wanted to ride the Jaws ride, I literally didn't care about anything else. The minute I saw that fin in the water though, I got terrified and I refused to look at the shark. Throughout the rest of the day, my mom tried to convince me to get back on Jaws. I enjoyed Confrontation. I enjoyed many other attractions. And finally, she had me convinced to ride Jaws. We went to the bathroom outside the attraction. I said, Mom, you're sure the shark does not pop out in the dark, right? She said, no, absolutely it does not. Then a stranger came out of another stall and goes, yes, it does. My mom shot her death guard because clearly my mom was lying to me to get me back on the attraction, knowing this is the whole reason we came to the park and I would not get back in the water. Currently, if I want to ride the full Jaws ride, I've got to go to Japan. Or if I want to see part of the Jaws ride, you can go to Universal Studios Hollywood where on their studio backlot tour, you can see a segment of what Jaws was like here with a little Amity Island moment and a mechanical Bruce the Shark, which I have done many, many times. But if I want the full experience, we got to go to Japan. So put that on the bucket list. We've made it to our first stop though, the Universal Legacy Store. This used to be the main Universal Studios store. However, they opened a bigger one across the way. So now they mostly celebrate attractions of Universal's past, as well as props and things from some of their movie franchises. And right when you walk in here, you see one of the greatest things in Universal Orlando, possibly better than Velocicoaster. I don't think that's dramatic. This is the screen used jacket worn by Chief Martin Brody in 1975. Cinematic masterpiece, Jaws. This is movie history, people. Jaws was considered the first summer blockbuster, which is now today why big movies come out in the summer. Barbie and Heimer, you can thank Jaws for this. Jaws was directed by Steven Spielberg and it's what put him on the Mac. He was very, very young in his 20s. Jaws was a disaster to film. It went way over schedule, way over budget. I've talked about this before in other Jaws related content, but Jaws also kicked off one of my favorite movie traditions. In 1977, Star Wars directed by Steven Spielberg's buddy George Lucas dethroned Jaws as the current king of domestic film rentals. Because of that, Steven Spielberg sent a letter to Jaws with a picture of R2-D2 fishing Jaws and he congratulated him on taking over the top spot. Since then, the tradition has continued. When E.T. beat Star Wars at the box office, George wrote Steven a letter. Then in 1997, there was a theatrical re-release of the Star Wars trilogy. E.T. got knocked out, so Steven had to write George another letter. A year later, Titanic beat out Star Wars, so George Lucas wrote James Cameron a letter. In 2015, Jurassic World has the largest worldwide opening for a movie of all time, taking the title from the Avengers, so, so Marvel Studios wrote a letter to Universal. Then, just a few weeks later, Star Wars took the record from Jurassic World, so Universal wrote Lucasfilm a letter. Three years later, Avengers Infinity War took the title from Star Wars Episode Seven, so Lucasfilm wrote a letter to Marvel Studios. I'm sure they just interofficed it because it's all owned by Disney, but it's still fun. In 2019, Avengers Endgame beat Titanic at the box office, making Titanic the third highest grossing film of all time. So James Cameron wrote Kevin Feige and everyone at Marvel a letter. And then a few weeks later, he had to write them another letter because Avengers Endgame also beat Avatar, putting them in number two. The joke has even expanded to include actors because in 2019, Joker beat Deadpool 2 to become the highest grossing R-rated film of all time. So Ryan Reynolds, who plays Deadpool, tweeted a funny joke aimed at the Joker that I cannot read on this family-friendly channel. And lastly, in 2021, a re-release of Avatar reclaimed the top spot, so the Russo brothers, the directors of Avengers Endgame, posted this for James Cameron on Instagram. And I just love that tradition of passing on the baton, giving a nod to the next filmmaker. I love that it started with Jaws um, and it's continued all the way through some of the best movies of all time. But back to Jaws, they're actually playing the score in here right now and it's lovely. You can find tons of great Jaws merchandise in this shop, anywhere here from lounge fly, backpack, wallet, purse, I have the purse, plushes, t-shirts, hats. What is this? Do I need this? Is this salt and pepper shaker? Stop it. Oh my gosh, those are awesome. But there's one superior souvenir we're gonna go get. 
Here they have one of the Moldomatic machines, which molds real plastic into a figurine right before your very eyes. And here you can get the shark from Jaws. So we're gonna get one. It's $8. It's really cool. I'm gonna put it on my desk. Another place at Universal that you can see real props from the movie Jaws is here at the Horror Makeup Show. This is an opening day show. And inside the lobby, even if you don't wanna see the show, which you should, cause it's awesome. But inside the lobby, they have real movie props from some of Universal's most famous productions, including Jaws. That's why we're talking about this, but you'll also see things from How the Grinch Stole Christmas, Jurassic Park, Chucky, Halloween, even movies as old as the original Frankenstein, Psycho. Really, really cool if you're a movie fan to step in here. Taking a quick peek at the Jaws selection because we got to go over to our final destination. You will see Ben Gardner's head. This is one of the most iconic scenes of Jaws, one of the scariest scenes of Jaws. You've also got photos from production as well as shark teeth. It's just so cool here that the real Ben Gardner's head is located here. If you wanna watch a really cool Shark Week special, 2012, I believe, they did a special called How Jaws Changed the World. And it's all about Jaws and how it impacted sharks. And as much as I love Jaws, it's my favorite movie of all time. It was actually pretty bad for sharks because it made people think that all sharks were mindless human eating monsters, um, which, is definitely not true. It costs a lot of people to go shark hunting, uh, not just for great whites, but all different kinds of sharks because people thought they were out to kill humans, which they're definitely not, to the point where many, many species got very close to that endangered or that almost extinct level, which as I've been talking about this video, you're seeing some sharks are still out there. Luckily, the great white has come back a little bit, but there was so much misinformation about sharks and Jaws that the author of Jaws, the novel, Peter Benchley, said if he knew what he knew about sharks after he wrote Jaws, and he knew what humans would do to sharks because of that book, he would never have written it. In fact, he became a huge shark conservationist and shark advocate um, because of the outcome of Jaws. And again, this isn't me saying you can't enjoy Jaws or Jaws 2 or Jaws 3D or Jaws Revenge or Sharknado or The Meg or Deep Blue Sea or The Shallows or any other ridiculous shark attack movie. But you just need to know they're not true. In fact, I asked wildlife expert Forrest Galante uh, if he watched shark attack movies and what his thoughts were on them. Because as a shark expert, can you sit by and watch that? Or are you just annoyed the whole time that sharks are being misrepresented? And this is what he said. No, I love it. I think it's great. You know, I'll watch those stupid flying piranhas movies and sharknados and all of it. I, it's, it you have to take those things for entertainment value. You know, I, I think the biggest mistake someone can make is go and watch a movie like Jaws and think that it's anything more than a movie, mm -hmm. you know, and, and at least speaking for myself, I can completely disconnect entertainment from reality. And, and when I watch Jaws, to me, it's the same as watching Avatar, you know, yeah. they're just completely <laughs> made up worlds that are fun to immerse yourself in for two hours versus taking them as something real. Headed into the old Amity area of Universal Studios Florida. Again, this is where Jaws the Ride used to live, and it's now getting closer to the entrance of Wizarding World of Harry Potter, Diagon Alley. Now, that's not to say there aren't a few nods to the predecessor if you go poking around the Wizarding World. I've talked about it in many of my secrets videos, but there is a record in the record shop that is a nod to Quint. The shrunken heads back in Nocturne Alley sing Show Me the Way to Go Home, the same song that the trio sing in Jaws. And there's also actual shark jaws that were used in the queue of the attraction in both Borgen and Burke's and Mulpepper's Apothecary. There's also a few windows left over in that area painted on some of the restaurants and such that refer to Amity Island, which is again the fictional town where Jaws takes place. It's actually Martha's Vineyard. But the biggest, toothiest, fightiest thing left from Jaws the Ride is right here. It's Bruce. And while I love him, and I've taken a thousand selfies with this shark, it's never really made sense to me because like, what shark is it? It can't be the shark from Jaws because that shark explodes. This is supposed to take place the next year. So you're telling me that the Amity Island fisherman found another giant great white shark and hung it up here? I don't, but Jaws too. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I don't know what this shark is supposed to be. Canonical. I'll tell you what he isn't though. He is not the screen used shark from Jaws, which I have heard people ask. 
In fact, the last remaining shark that was used in the movie Jaws is in Los Angeles, California at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. I did a whole video on the museum and I had a reaction to seeing the real Bruce the Shark. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. few things to talk about when it comes to Jaws, both here at the theme parks and the movie. For starters, Jaws in the film is 25 feet long, which is ridiculous. The biggest shark on record is 20 feet long, estimated to be about 4,500 pounds. Her name was Deep Blue and she was a pregnant female. They actually captured her on Shark Week in 2014. She's awesome. But that led scientists to wonder, are female great white sharks the queens of the ocean? Are they the dominant fish in the sea? Well, of course, I had to ask an expert to confirm. When it comes to great whites, it would point that females are going to be dominant. Whether or not it's applicable to other species of sharks is a little different because of the sort of the different kinds of reproduction that they have. But certainly for great whites, when you think that to be a pregnant female shark requires you to eat more. It puts you at more uh, more risk. Uh, you're you know putting energy and effort into growing these babies, so you need to make sure they do well. So they need to be in a position where they're calling the shots. Uh, you know, not just because of the right access to food, but also to the access to their uterus. And to wrap up our Sharktacular special, we are headed here to Shea Alcatraz, this cute little walk-up bar right next to Bruce to grab a famous shark-themed cocktail. Out of the water, there's a shark! Oh, that's me and my on the Oh, your toes are tasty. Wrapping the day with a shark-themed cocktail, the Ocean Attack. This is Don Q Coconut Rum, Blue Curacao, Pineapple Juice, Sprite, and a dash of grenadine. Now, that is an incredibly sweet drink. I don't care for incredibly sweet drinks. I did ask her to swap in club soda for the Sprite. I hope it would cut down the sweetness a little bit. But you know what? When it's Shark Week, you drink shark-themed cocktails. Cheers. Oh, God, it's so sweet. Oh, my, it's so sweet. Definitely glad I got club soda instead of Sprite because it's an incredibly sweet cocktail. I actually like coconut rum because I like the flavor of coconut and I will drink it with just club soda and maybe a lime. Um, but having blue curacao and pineapple juice and grenadine, it does make it incredibly sweet, very tropical, but refreshing at the same time because of that club soda. Not something I would personally order if it wasn't for Shark Week, but the uh, theatrics of it and of course the theming make it a perfect drink to end this video. Well, that's the final bite of the Mammoth Club Sharktacular special. I hope you had fun following along the theme parks to see where sharks pop up, seeing real sharks over at Epcot, talking about the most famous shark in the world here at Universal, and hearing from real shark experts from Shark Week and Discovery Channel and beyond. Hopefully learning a little bit more about sharks, especially some lesser known species, makes you think differently about sharks if you didn't already love them. And why sharks are important? Well, I'm gonna leave that to the experts to explain. The simplest way to put it is if sharks disappear, we're not having this conversation, okay? We're, humans are gone, okay? Let that sink in for a half second because sharks are a keystone species that manage and help the health of our oceans. And if our oceans collapse, there's no more human beings. Oceans account for our rain. They account for most of our oxygen, 90% of the world's protein, and the list goes on and on and on. And if the ocean collapses, human life as we know it ceases to exist. The, the ocean regulates all of our climate, all of our weather. Um, it provides so much food, protection, coastal protection I mean, it's, it's everything for us so um and we don't see that every day but you know we obviously can make choices to help help the ocean you know in our everyday with plastics and food choices and these things but you know we're talking about shark week here so i would just say that you know the best thing we can do is is celebrate sharks you know this, this is the opportunity to do that next week this is the ultimate celebration of these animals getting the facts out there talking about them sharing what we know um you know the more people know about sharks the better 
Now, obviously, I care deeply about sharks every day of the year, not just during my Holy Week of Shark Week, but Mammoth Club has donated $500 to Shark Stewards. This is a nonprofit organization dedicated to saving endangered shark species from shark finning and overfishing, as well as protecting critical marine habitats. You can also do things like buy cool shark jewelry like I'm wearing, which I paid for. This was not gifted. I purchased this. It's from Pura Vida. 5% uh, of their new Shark Week collection is going to Oceana, a huge nonprofit that's dedicated to protecting the oceans. In fact, there are several companies, including Knock Around Sunglasses, uh, that have done Shark Week collabs that are giving money back to protecting sharks. I also want to point out that I am not being paid to promote Shark Week, which many of you probably know as I've been talking about Shark Week for ever. That said, I was an invited member of the press prior to the SAG strike to attend a virtual junket to talk to these shark experts about their specials on Shark Week this year. I did my due diligence prior to making this video, and from what I can find, Shark Week was not impacted. The sharks will not unionize. However, ultimately, Discovery Channel is owned by Warner Brothers Discovery, and obviously Mammoth Club stands with the writers and actors during their strike. In honor of that and to show our support of the WGA and SAG, we've also made a $500 donation to the Entertainment Community Fund, which is a fund being used to help writers and actors as they're out of work striking on the street for fair wages. If you're interested in donating to either of these organizations, we have linked all of that down below. A huge, huge megalodon size thank you to Dr. Austin Gallagher, Forrest Galante, and Tom the Fish Herd for speaking with me about sharks. I cannot tell you, like, eight-year-old Molly still cannot believe that she got to speak with the people she's been watching on TV for years and years. Behind the scenes, I literally burst into tears once the press junket was over. Uh, thank you to you for watching and supporting Mammoth Club. It's because of you all that we get opportunities like this. I'm so, so grateful. Hopefully you had fun. Again, this is a different style of video, but it's something very near and dear to my heart, so hopefully you enjoyed it. Tell me your favorite shark down in the comments. Make sure you're following Mammoth Club and me on social media right now because I will be avidly watching Shark Week. Can't wait for the new Air Jaw special. That's my favorite one of the year. In the meantime, friends, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, follow us on social media, join us on Discord where we hang out with the Mayhem fam and have great conversation. And until next time, friends, I'm Molly, and it's been Jawsome.